These are the AKG K340s. They are the world's first electrostatic dynamic headphone. And currently, they are my personal favorite pair of headphones. And I'll explain why. It has to do with the technology that they use, it being electrostatic and dynamic. I'll go into detail about what exactly that means and how it works, but first I just want to talk about the build quality. But before I go into that, I just want to acknowledge that today is a beautiful day here in Southern California. It's a little hard to tell, but my goodness, this is the perfect beach weather. It's, it's all sorts of wonderful. It's a shame that we're all in quarantine right now. I would totally be going to the beach at the moment. But going back to the build quality of this, I want to start off with this cable right here. It's a coiled cable. I believe it stretches out to about six feet long and it terminates in a quarter inch jack. This quarter inch jack is not particularly nice. Let's see if I can focus on it. Ooh, almost at it. Let me turn over here. Almost, come on. You can see that the edges right here are a bit frayed and that's because every time I try to plug it into my amp, the fact that it's very flat right here prevents it from going into the countersink that's on the jack itself. As a result, these edges get frayed very bad and that's what I don't like about this jack. One of my goals is actually to replace not only the jack but the entire cable itself with something that's removable and something that's a bit more manageable, something that makes more sense in a modern sense. It's not bad, but it could just be better. What is nice is this cable though. Even though I said I want to replace it, it's not because I don't like this cable, it's just because I want it to be removable. This cable is very nice. I personally really enjoy coiled cables on headphones. And the reason why I have these two things right here is just to serve as a comparison to this cable right here. I want to start off with that cable right there. This is from an Audio-Technica M50X. It's the removable one with a coil. And the coil on this cable is garbage. You'll notice how the majority of the cable is just a regular straight cable and only about a third of the overall length is coiled. This makes no sense to me. I don't understand why they thought this was a good idea. I mean, you compare it to the AKGs, right? It starts here and the majority of the cable is coiled. Why, who thought that only making 30% of the cable coiled was a good idea? It's beyond me. Now let's go on to this, where this is a more old school headphone, but if we look at the coil on this one, this makes a bit more sense, right? It starts early and maintains the coil for the majority of the headphone. Who, like, <laughs> really this section is just for me to make fun of this coiled cable here. I remember when I first got the Audio-Technica M50Xs, right? I, I took out this cable, this was the default cable, and all I could think to myself was, who who designed this? Who designed this and who thought this was a good idea? This is just very annoying. I don't like it at all. Comparing this coil though to this coil, I think I prefer this one a bit more. The diameter of the coil is a little bit uh, larger compared to this. This is like a centimeter while this is about eight millimeters. It's just the extra thickness here gives it a gives it a nice feel to it. It gives it a bit more air, while this, every time I hold it in my hand, it kind of just feels a little bit cheap. It feels like a phone cable, while this feels a bit more luxurious. Also, the fact that you have the four cables lined up right there, while this is all the cables are just kind of wrapped in a synthetic rubber, that adds a bit of texture to it that I think is a bit appealing to the hand. Moving on from the cable though, let's talk about this right here. So this is, the cups are attached to a swivel mount. They don't actually move left and right, they only move up and down and the range of motion that they have moving up and down or I guess tilting up and down is very limited. So this is the farthest up it can turn and this is the farthest down it can turn. Very, very little range of motion there. And the twisting comes from the flexibility of this headband here like that. But even then, it doesn't really twist too far just because these metal bands give it a bit more rigidity. These headphones are, I believe, open back. It's a little bit hard to see, but there's a gap right here 
that allows the sound or the air of the driver to escape out the back which is typical of AKG headphones, I think. I think when I think of classic AKG headphones, I think of semi-open design. So it fits right in, but compared to the other AKG headphones at the time, the K240s, those have a ring that's open around the back, while the main thing itself, I believe, is locked on. So this is a little bit, a little bit more interesting. Moving on to the headband right here, it looks uncomfortable, but it's not, surprisingly. The main thing that kind of makes it seem uncomfortable is these bumps right here. This, Some of the bumps are really, really stiff, and I can't really tell if they're filled with some type of like a memory foam or if they're just filled with air, and every time you squeeze them, just the motion of going back into shape pulls the air back in, and that's kind of how it reinflates itself. But it's actually not uncomfortable. It's just... It just doesn't look like it is comfortable. When it's on your head, you don't even really notice that it's there, which is pretty cool. But it's not exactly the nicest thing to look at. Perhaps when it was brand new, the sheen on, I believe it's leather, would have been a little bit more brilliant, but time has definitely faded any sort of glossiness that might have been on the headband itself. Right above the headband are these steel bands that connect the two cups together. They act as a way of removing tension away from the headband itself and also for connecting the cups so that way you can get your left and your right. The headphone is a single entry so the cable enters in through this cup and then it connects over to this. The way that it does that is that it has four wires. Two of the wires connect to the driver itself right here. The remaining two are soldered onto the steel bands and then these steel bands transfer that electricity all the way to this cup here. Some would argue that this way that it connects the two degrades the sound a little bit and that it'd be preferable to have a dual entry that meet up at a point. But in my opinion, that's probably not going to make too big a difference. It might change the sound a little bit to be just slightly better, but for the most part, this is perfectly fine, in my opinion. There's also little elastics on the inside here. Let me focus. There's these little elastics here that tend to give up over time. These aren't the original ones that came with the headphone when I first got them. I actually replaced them already. The original ones give out just because of their age, and so you need to replace them in order to get a proper seal on your head, or else these, these headphones, they're quite big, they're going to sag on your head. So the elastics as is a way of adjusting the ear cups so that way they sit on your head properly. But the procedure of doing that is very, very simple, and I'll make a video explaining how to do it at a later time. Moving on to the pads. The pads are quite big. This cup is ginormous, actually. Whenever I wear these headphones, I look at myself in the mirror and I just think to myself how silly I look wearing them because they're giant. They're huge. They're really, really big. I believe the diameter is about 110 millimeters, which is, which is just huge. They're huge. And when you put them on, your head looks so wide because they, they stretch out like this. And it just looks really, really funny to me. The pads have deflated over time and they're not particularly comfortable. They don't have enough plushness to them to prevent my ear from pressing against the inner plastic and as a result it becomes very uncomfortable to wear them over an extended period of time. So one of my goals, another one of my goals is to replace the pads on these to something that's a little bit more plush. The only thing that I'm torn uh, between is whether I want to get PU pleather pads or velour pads. I actually bought a, re a pair of replacement pads already. They were sheepskin leather. However, the thickness of those pads were too much for these headphones. I mentioned earlier how the tilt here is very limited. Because of that, whenever I put those ear pads on, the thickness of them prevented the ear pads to create a proper seal on my head, so sound was escaping out the bottom. So if you plan on getting ear pads for these, try and get something that's not too thick. The sheepskin leather pads were 30 millimeters, I believe. So 25 and below would be perfect for these. Even uh, 105 millimeter would be better than 110 millimeter pads. Just because I believe 
these pads are 105 while the sheepskin leather are 110. They fit on perfect but again that issue of not getting a proper seal is a bit of a problem. I'm going to remove the ear pad right now so that way we can take a look at the baffle plate underneath it and then I'll talk a little bit more about the technology these things use. Comes off very easy. One of the things I really enjoy about the design of this is that the crisscross pattern on the plastic baffle juxtaposes against the shiny metal of the driver beneath it. And if you look at it with a pad on, I think it looks brilliant. That is pretty swanky if you ask me. I, I really like it. But going back to the beginning, I talked about how these are the world's first electrostatic dynamic headphones. And what that means is that they're actually a hybrid design and at the time it was one of a kind. It uses an electric driver to produce the higher frequencies, I believe from four kilohertz and up, and a dynamic driver to do the lower frequencies from four kilohertz and below. And the idea behind that design is if you can use the electric driver to handle the frequencies that an electric driver is really good at, and a dynamic driver to handle the frequencies that a dynamic driver is really good at, then you get the best of both worlds and something that's superb or superior to just one technology over the other. Whether or not that actually works is up to personal opinion. In my opinion, I think that the higher frequencies seem to struggle a bit, and reading charts based off measurements of this headphone it seems that these headphones do indeed struggle with higher frequencies, which is a bit ironic because electra or electrostatic drivers typically should do an extremely good job with higher frequencies, but these seem to struggle very much so with those frequencies. What they do excel at, however, is mid-range frequencies. They do an excellent job at the middle frequencies, the frequencies that you're going to be exposed to the most. These things do an impressive job at soundstage. I was reading a brochure from the time that was talking about these headphones, how the way that they were able to accomplish the soundstage was the back of the drivers were designed with comb filtering in mind, and it's because of that comb filtering that allows it to sound as brilliant as it does. If you know anything about AKG headphones, uh, specifically early AKG headphones from the 70s, they had a design with the AKG K240s called the Sextet. And the Sextet employed a passive radiator that was meant to tune the sound as it reflects off your head. What happens with headphones is as the sound comes out of the driver, some of the sound reflects back into the cup from your head. And the Sextets employed six passive radiators that were meant to tune the sound of that reflection in order to get a more, uh, I guess you could say, a more ideal sound from the headphone. The AKG K340s has a similar design where you have the driver in the middle and then around it are five passive radiators that are designed to tune the sound. I think that's a bit maddening when you think about it because this is, when you think about it, these headphones are exactly the same as an AKG K240, but they just took an electrostatic driver and shoved it in there and then just made a brand new headphone from it. These headphones were top of the line for the time, so they really went all out for the design of it. And I think it kind of pays off over time because even though these don't hold a candle to a lot of modern headphones, especially modern AKGs, they hold up pretty well compared to the price that I paid. I mean, I only paid $15 for them and these, these absolutely blow away any headphone for 15 bucks that you can buy like at a Best Buy. If you're interested in getting these headphones, I wouldn't recommend them for an expensive price. On eBay, I think the cheapest I saw it for was about $130, and I, I do not think that you should buy these headphones for $130. Bucks. You're much better off buying a more modern headphone. That would go a longer way than getting these headphones, because they are limited in that sense, especially with modern music, specifically fast music, fast electronic music. They tend to choke up a little bit because they don't really know how to react to that. Electronic music at the time of these headphones creation were very, very different. And the technologies that they used to test these headphones were also extremely different. They weren't as precise as they are with modern equipment. With that in mind though, if you can get them for cheap, absolutely get them. I think they're wonderful. I'm planning on making more videos about these. 
uh, addressing a couple of the concerns that I have with them and maybe a couple fun videos where I mod the hell out of these headphones but that'll be for a later date. For now thank you for watching. I hope you all have a great day.